Arctis is trusted to safeguard the world's most sensitive information. Australian government and defence organisations rely on Arctis solutions to safeguard and enable secure collaboration of sensitive and classified information anywhere. Visit arctis.com to learn more. Welcome to the Defence Connect podcast with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hey gang, hey, hey, Phil Tarrant, host of the Defence Connect podcast. Thanks for joining us today in lockdown in Sydney. Um, it sounds like and it feels as though uh, we're going to be in this for a little bit longer here. However, the rest of the nation seems to be coming out of it. Um, Melbourne only just announced uh, an easing of their restrictions. I uh, saw the South Australian Premier on the television this morning. Uh, talking about moving forward, removing restrictions. There's still some in place. WA just keeps bounding ahead and uh, our friends up to the north in Queensland working hard to keep the borders safe and secure and COVID, the Delta variant, out of the state. What's happening up in Queensland right now is Talisman Sabre. It's a real shame, um, Defence Connect. We like to get to this exercise, which you all know is held uh, every second year. Uh, a really good showcase of interoperability between our allied nations, including the United States. There's a whole bunch of other partner nations there participating and also some, some observer uh, nations as well. It's good to get those teams together to work towards drilling and scenario playing out how any challenges to the uh, Pacific may play out over the next couple of years. So that's underway right now. We've been covering it at length on defenseconnect.com.au. Thought we'd chat about that today with my colleagues here, plus a whole bunch of other news making headlines. Lee Garman, our editor of Defence and Security, and also Shabel Kadib, who is our news editor. Gentlemen, how are you going? You well? Good day, Phil. How are you? We're very well. We're still stuck in lockdown and Luckily, we've got another four weeks here, so we just got to settle in, dig in, get used to it. But no, lots of news in the defence industry to keep us very busy going yeah, forward. Yeah, I, I would have, I would have thought with you guys with nothing else to do, that would be tripling our uh, our content delivery during this period of time. I see you've oh, got a nice moustache there, mate. I'm not going to call you out on that. <laughs> yeah, it's the um, it's the lockdown facial hair. You know, you can be a little bit more creative when no one's watching you every day. Look, we are we are um expanding our content a fair bit. We've got a new Momentum Media brand that we're kickstarting and we're getting out every day, which is cybersecurityconnect.com.au. And that is the hub for all of Australia's leading cybersecurity news. And there's a lot of really interesting things going on in the cyber world, as well as the defense world, because as you know, they're quite interlocked and it seems like every day you refresh the news and then there's been a massive new cyber attack that's crippled tens and tens of thousands of computers around the world. And it's a growing industry, really impacts uh, defence. So we've been working on that as well. But going back to Talisman Sabre, a lot, obviously a lot of news coming out of there because we have a lot of our allied nations that are in Australia and, and in the sea around Australia conducting multi-domain exercises so it's uh it's a very very exciting world in the defense and security space at the moment yeah absolutely and, and we'll get some insights from uh Charbel in a minute on talisman save it to your point around cyber security connect really exciting stuff thanks so much to you and your team Liam for driving that forward I mean right across the coverage and the commentary and I would say long overdue a product like this um you know the interconnectivity between the national security environment and a defense environment and Cyber security, but it is emerging field in itself, and it's just not defence that has application to cyber. It's all of Australia. It's all of government. It's all of corporate Australia. Our large ASX listed businesses, right the way through to our very talented SME sector and micro business. You would have tuned into uh, the podcast I did recently with Marcus Thompson, retired uh, Major General, who used to head up Cyber Command. We had a really good chat a couple of weeks ago around cyber and. It just goes so much more context to me and to us here at Momentum Media around the need for a product like Cybersecurity Connect. So we're going to be right across that moving forward. Our approach to the cybersecurity domain is going to be towards national resilience, digital resilience, digital sovereignty, and all of Australia supporting stronger economic and national security and prosperity as a result of being more cyberly aware and getting in place what needs to get in place in order to make those protections. And I've been reading the commentary, uh, Liam, you know, it just feels as though every single day there's a, a litany of 
of cyber attacks and every single level and particularly, and we spoke about this on the podcast for defence SMEs, it's a key responsibility and accountability for them to be right across this domain if they want to participate in defence industry. And I know it's one of the headlines on defenseconnect.com.au today, uh, Arctis, which is uh, a platform for sharing secure information. It just had its biggest quarter ever, up 80%. So it looks like people are now buying this sort of software to make sure that they can participate effectively inside cybersecurity. But outside of this particular podcast, go and check out cybersecurityconnect.com.au. If you're on Defence Connect, you can click through to it. It's pretty easy stuff. Any information, any news, any tip-offs, any sort of insights you feel as though we should be getting within the cyber domain. Liam, where's the best place for them to send that through? You can either contact us direct. So the contact details will be on cybersecurityconnect.com.au for my personal email address, or you can contact the editor at defenseconnect.com.au and that will forward through to the cybersecurity team as well. Brilliant. Nice one. Now, Talisman Sabre, two years ago, um, Defence Connect, we sort of got involved in a whole bunch of the things that were happening uh, for Talisman Sabre, which included spending some time with uh, the American Air Force on some refuelling missions of uh, F-22 Raptors and F-18s coming off the carriers and and the uh, F-22s out of Ambly and also uh, some time out on the uh, USS Ronald Reagan watching flight operations there. Alas, we can't do the same thing uh, this year. It was good to see that in motion and just how connected the two nations were, Australia and the US, in driving forward and and pursuing interoperability across all these assets and how we, we operate together. What's the difference with 2021, Shaba, with Talisman Sabre? No doubt uh, uh, it's a little bit more social distancing going on and probably a little bit less integration. What's the latest, mate? Because we're smack bang in the middle of this exercise right now. Yeah, definitely a lot of firsts for this year's iteration of exercise Talisman Sabre. A lot of the world's major defence platforms en route to Australia, uh, US destroyers, Australian frigates, the latest technology, fifth generation of fighter jets here um, in the North Queensland sort of participating in this interoperability exercises, Patriot missiles being deployed for the first time this year, HMAS uh, Brisbane leading Air and Missile Defence Command for the first time, and some controversy as well. Um, a few Chinese uh, intelligence ships spotted um, en route to Australia. That isn't um, the first time that's happened. 2017, 2019, uh, one surveillance ship um, arrived to monitor the activities, but for the first time this year, a second ship arrived, which surprised a lot of observers, including our Minister for Defence, Peter Dutton. Of course, they're monitoring that situation, but given the escalation intentions, it's probably, I guess, just another signal sending a second ship this year. A lot of flexing, I guess, on their end, but him, Minister Dutton made the point that we're sort of prepared for um, we're prepared for this and that they're monitoring the situation. But a lot of firsts this year, a huge multinational exercise, other nations as well taking part, the UK, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, Canada. Um, and observer nations, France and India as well. So a lot's happening up there in Queensland. Yeah, and um, to the the two Chinese surveillance ships out there, no doubt, and the sort of the read I'm getting from it and and from various people is that it's just added another layer of realism to the exercise, the fact that you have uh, those ships in the neighbourhood keeping an eye on what's going on. So no doubt there's plenty of... uh, a fun and skullduggery underway as we speak, as this exercise uh, develops. That you know, big, big. Um, we've seen a lot of imagery coming through through uh, the defenseconnect.com.au and out of the ADF. Uh, it's a shame we can't be there. Any highlights for you so far? Watching observer, your armchair observer, Charbel. What's been the sort of highlight for you so far from Talisman Sabre? Yeah, definitely the missile, the air defense missile exercises up at Chellwater um, uh, Bay Training Area. Um, a huge display of of air strength there. Frigates, destroyers uh, representing Australia, Japan, and the US, really, you know, showcasing their firepower. You know, airlift uh, aircraft, fighter jets as well taking part, um, and Brisbane as well representing the Navy, leading that command um, for the first time. That's definitely a highlight for me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, right across defenseconnect.com to this week, uh, a news flash, and we're pretty sparingly on this. And often news flashes, I remember back to uh, a couple of years ago when it was just headline announcement after headline announcement, um, Land 400 Phase 2, the C5000 program, C1000 program, et cetera. We haven't had any major, huge, significant acquisition announcements for a little while, but they're still out there in the business of defence uh, paves and, and pushes ahead. There's still a whole bunch of contracts being delivered. One of them over the week, Aquatero secures landmark $35 million defence contract, great story, Aquatero, great business, 
we like sort of keeping an eye on them at defenseconnect.com.au. Give them a leg up where we can because they're doing some great work. Liam, what do we know about this specific deal? So Aquatero is an interesting one because Aquatero is a Melbourne-based company and it's Aussie from the ground up, complete Australian company. I don't even think I would classify it necessarily as an SME anymore because they've, they've done the hard yards and they've grown as a company. So they've been given a $35 million contract by defence to refurbish and upgrade our current line of combat helmets. And so the expectation at the moment is that these upgrades and refurbishments will basically extend the lifeline and the service time of these helmets by about another five years. And what's really cool about this specific contract is that Aquatero is the first company outside of the United States to actually refurbish the Wendy built helmets, which is really good because it is a story that these Australian businesses actually do have the capabilities, the innovativeness and the ability to actually to compete on a world stage and create defense equipment, which is just as good, if not better than US built equipment. And it's really good because this is a company which is Aussie from the ground up. Yeah, it's good. Well done, Aquatero. Um, congratulations to you. It's good to see organizations like this securing these contracts. It's good to see the government is issuing these contracts. And we'll chat a little bit later around around supply chain development coming out of the, the Minister of Defence Industry. We're going to go to a break, gents. When we come back, uh, I want to get into some news around C5000 and also the Spartan back in a moment. Tickets to attend the Australian Defence Industry Awards Gala Night at the National Convention Centre in Canberra are selling out fast. The awards recognise the talented and dedicated professionals leading the charge and advancing Australia's defence sector, rewarding them with a prestigious accolade and national exposure. Spaces to attend are strictly limited. Secure your table today by visiting australiandefenceindustryawards.com.au. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, uh, host of Defence Net Podcast. I'm joined by my colleagues on Defence Connect, our editor, Defence and Security, Lean Garman, and news editor, Shabal Khadib. Now, let's go to C5000, which is, we all know, the project to build the new class of frigates in Australia. We've been keeping a close eye on this all the way through from the competition between the three competitors to secure this. Uh, we all know that BAE was the successful winner for this for the uh, Type 26 Global Combat Ship, which is the choice of the Royal Navy and also the choice of the uh, Canadian Navy, if my memory serves me right. So there's been this work up through this whole period of time, lots underway. We had Gabby Koskin, CEO of BAE Systems Australia on the podcast a few months ago. We spoke about this, but now we're seeing Chabelle, some uh, contracts being awarded around it. A local SME wins C5000 pilot order. And this is Western Australian-based firm tapped in to develop a prototype for the potential integration of the Royal Navy's future frigates. What do we know? Yeah, so more good news for local industry following on from the um, Aquatero news. Uh, Veeam, um, they're based uh, southeast of Perth, was awarded a $180,000 contract to develop a propeller blade prototype for the future frigates. And this follows on from their receipt of, I think, almost $900,000 of funding from the government um, through the Manufacturing Modernization Fund. They'll be uh, working alongside Kongsberg to develop this prototype. And if successful, we won't know until next year, mid-2022, if they're ultimately going to be uh, selected to develop these propeller braids for the frigates. But they have already commenced work with Kongsberg. Um, they were successful following a feasibility study last year, I think three other Local uh, Australian firms were part of that feasibility study. Veeam was ultimately selected, but more good news for them. I think the first steel cut for the first frigate will commence the end of next year. So progress for the C5000 program, there's been, there have been some delays along the way. I think the weight of the frigate was more than initially anticipated, but nonetheless, progress is being made. And this is another win for local industry. And what's the latest with uh, the Osborne Shipyard ongoing development down there? Anything that we've heard recently? Yeah, so at the moment, it's on schedule to house the the steel cut for uh, the frigates the end of next year. So that's uh, still on schedule and planned. But yeah, hopefully no other disruptions related to COVID and that sort of thing that may affect any you know, further development. Yeah, it's a big unknown right now uh, with COVID, but uh, hopefully everyone there in the defence industry is heading off to the local chemist or doctor or vaccination area to get the jab in the arm to, to hopefully give us some sense of stability to proceed and progress as a nation, keep the 
the wheels of the economy moving forward. Uh, hopefully, guys, you've lined up and, and and got the jab. But anyway, let's not get in the whole ax- anti-vaccine debate. I think most people in defence industry are sensible enough to go about doing that. But while we're talking about some of the opportunities there for the local SME sector in Australia, of which we are here at Defence Connect right behind, with some really practical discussions around it as well. And we've had, Liam, you would have known over the last little while, uh, some good discussions with uh, various people on the podcast about the realities of operating inside defence industry. Yes, there is intent from the government. Yes, there is intent from our primes to support defence industry with contracts. But the inverse of that is that defence industry and organisations within it need to be prepared and able to undertake this work. We have our AIC summit coming up in August uh, in Canberra, where a lot of these types of issues are going to be addressed, helping to prepare the SME sector to be better participants inside a defence industry, and to all, quite frankly, in some of the challenges in securing defence work and how you can best gear yourselves to do that. But I know it's a big focus and it's high on the the agenda of our defence industry minister helping the SME sector and trying to unravel and provide a structure and architecture or scaffold at least to support supply chain integration domestically to get more Aussie businesses as part of the domestic supply chain. But there's a review underway now and how do we can get these businesses also into global supply chains? Tell me more about that, mate. Yeah, I think one of the biggest pieces of feedback that I get or you know, one of the biggest discussion points that I hear from Australian businesses, uh, Australian SMEs operating in the defence industry is that it's easy to say, hey, yep, we support Australian industry, we support Australian business, let's make sure defence buys as much Australian products as possible. But it's a very different thing actually superimposing it. And it's a very different thing if you are an Aussie small business owner, where do you start? And that's something that I hear all the time you know, where do I start? You know, I've got this really cool product offering, but I hear every day that it's easier for Australian small businesses to work with these multinationals, but where does it actually happen? And how can I actually grow my small, medium business to becoming a a large business, not only servicing Australia's domestic defence market, but an international defence market? And I think the government's definitely heard that kind of feedback loud and clear. So, What happened mid last week is that the Minister for Defence Industry, Melissa Price, announced the new Global Supply Chain Program Review. And that's going to be led by Lisa Paul, who's a a longtime public servant and policymaker. And Lisa will be leading this review to see how we can actually turn those kind of platitudes of, yep, let's build these Aussie small businesses to work in the defence industry, how we can transform that to actually becoming a reality. So what the government's doing is they're going to be working alongside eight multinational contractors to learn from their experiences and to touch into their global supply chains because a lot of these contractors are hugely global companies to touch into there and to see how we can slot Australian small businesses in there. Obviously, the wheels are slowly getting into motion with this, but it is very promising that the government has heard this feedback and they're really meeting it head on to say, okay, let's actually move out of the platitudes and let's move into action. What are we hearing from the minister's office, uh, Liam? Obviously, this is sort of, you know, more policy orientated stuff and, and putting this sort of architecture in place to do it, but there is true and real intent from there to actually make this happen. Yeah, I definitely think it is very, very truthful, very real goal. And this is across all defence. One of our biggest goals at the moment, not only just within defence, but geopolitically as a whole of government approach is to improve Australia's resilience and to improve our sovereign manufacturing. If COVID has, you know, well, obviously COVID taught us a lot of things, but one key thing it has taught us is that, hang on, there are going to be times where you cannot rely on the global supply chain, whether it's to fix a piece of equipment, whether it's to order something, you actually do have to have a capability to do at home because uh, very small supply shocks with COVID have actually led to kind of industry stalling things in some areas. So it has shown us that we do need to have a domiciled sovereign industry here. And that, I think, has been seen across government, but especially in defence and especially in defence industry. Yeah, absolutely. And as we're talking through all these um, defence contracts and showing the the positives of it, and we'd like to report these contracts being secured, it's good to see there is looking outwards as well as inwards. 
I remember back to um, uh, when Christopher Pine was Defence Industry Minister, he was sort of big on the export potential for SMEs into global supply chains. That still remains. I think he launched the original export book. I did a podcast with him probably a couple of years ago and we spoke at length around it. Uh, So it's good to see that this momentum is maintaining. No doubt there's a whole bunch of people saying that's all great, but more needs to be done. So we'll cover that extensively as we move forward on uh, defenseconnect.com.au. And just remember, securing your place inside the defence supply chain uh, is a dream for many SMEs in Australia. And I remember early doors when the 2016 white paper was handed out, it it felt like every man and his dog uh, in Australia who runs some sort of manufacturing shop or some sort of business wanted to get inside of defence business. They were rocking up to every single conference. There was a whole bunch of organisations who had never looked at defence And I think there was a realisation come sort of uh, 2017, 2018, 2019 that playing inside this space for SMEs, it's the long game. You need to have a lot of rigour, compliance, robust systems, focus towards cybersecurity, all of these things as a base level just to be able to participate and secure these contracts. And that's going to be one of the things we talk about in the AIC Summit, which is on 25th of August. You can go and check it out, aicsummit.com.au. If you haven't yet secured your place, very limited spots go and check it out. But if you're serious about being in defence business, probably worthwhile checking it out. But another really good story, uh, Liam, talking about defence contracts and, you know, let's chat about them because a lot of people say you never see ink on contracts. Well, guess what? It does happen. It might not happen as frequently as you like or at the speed or repetitive uh, nature that you would expect. However, uh, South Australian firm Salentium Defence, another very good business, secures $7.4 million contract uh, Australian Army for its Maverick M series passive radar system for testing. What do we know about this? So I think this is a really cool piece of technology. So it's a passive radar system, which is man operated. So it can be used by the operator on the battlefield. But unlike a lot of other radar systems that are on the market or used by our operators, This radar system leverages the existing bandwidth and frequencies that are already on the battlefield. So, for example, say there is a a television bandwidth that is on the battlefield. What this radar system does is it piggybacks off of that. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering or oversimplifying the the science. That's the only way I can understand it. I can already hear the furious typing to my emails of everyone correcting my science, but it kind of piggybacks off of those existing frequencies and those existing bandwidths, like a television bandwidth. And what that does is it doesn't create a signature that the radar is being deployed on the battlefield. Now, we all know that the way that war is being fought is changing. The character of war is in a huge bit of upheaval at the moment. You know, operators carry satellite radios, which can be picked up by unmanned drones, which do make our operators targets on the battlefield. What this does is it kind of cuts out that signature and allows the operators to be in comms but without leaving that footprint for the enemy to pick up. And I think this bit of hardware, it's going through a testing and evaluation with the Australian Army at the moment, but the concept I think is is really interesting and it will change the battle space for our infantry and our special forces operators. Mate, you've definitely, definitely gone and uh, done your homework on that and looked at the application of that, which is really good. Thanks for that uh, report, Liam. We'll go to another break when we come back. More on contracts. See you in a second. Arctis is trusted to safeguard the world's most sensitive information. Australian government and defence organisations rely on Arctis solutions to safeguard and enable secure collaboration of sensitive and classified information anywhere. Visit arctis.com to learn more. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, Lee Garman and Charbel Kadid, your team at defenseconnect.com.au. Uh, We sort of, I guess, lead the uh, defence and security content here at Momentum Media. I remember cybersecurityconnect.com.au. If you're not yet across that, go and check it out, Um, particularly everyone in defence industry, uh, to my point beforehand around the AOC Summit. If you're not participating, you don't have a focus on cybersecurity, you're probably not going to win too many contracts moving forward. Uh, Just a tip there. But um, just on that note, I remember the Australian Defence Industry Awards are now live. You can secure your tickets, the biggest networking event in defence for the year. Go and check it out also, uh, AustralianDefenseIndustryWars.com.au. That's way too many plugs in this particular podcast. Let's get down into some business of defence. Charbel, defence expands role of C-27J Spartan Fleet. This is the um, 
uh, the Leo Leonardo built fleet operated out of uh, 35 squadron RAF base Amberley replaced the uh, Vietnam era Caribou transport aircraft, which was uh, retired in 2009. So a bit of a gap there. Tell us about this story. Yeah, good news for number 35 squadron. Um, the Spartan was recently used in a lot of uh, bushfire missions, disaster relief missions. Of course, we all remember that crisis, the national crisis a few years back, and it's been used to support as well COVID relief. And because of its success, the role of the aircraft has now been expanded to um, humanitarian crisis response and broader regional relief missions, in addition to sort of the military airlift um, operations that it was primarily procured for. So that's alongside the Globe Master, the Hercules, the, the Chinook, which also provide, of course, uh, valuable airlift support. So um, positive news for that aircraft is, of course, the more we can use this, these 10 platforms that are available for us um, for all our mission needs, the better. So this is sort of another uh, positive for our regional partners as well, who will definitely benefit from us having the capacity to transport much needed relief for them. And it was also mentioned following the announcement that it support the Pacific Step Up program and sort of our broader efforts to strengthen our partnerships with regional peers in the Indo-Pacific. So, yeah, big news coming out of the rough. Yeah, no, good. Thanks for that uh, update there, Charbel. Now, um, Liam, uh, I've been really enjoying it and maybe a lot of our listeners aren't aware of it um, every single day on LinkedIn. Now, video-based news updates. Tell me a little bit about that, mate. How can you track it down? So what we've done is to condense our news because we know that this industry is, is so evolving. We have scientists, we have researchers, we have business development managers. There's never been a time where the defence industry has been more dynamic than it is now. So to save everyone time, we've started condensing the top news stories for that day for the last 24 hours into a, a short, sharp 30, 40 second video with the headline and an explanation of what's going on. So everyone in the industry can stay up to date with the most pressing topics for that day. So we've put it across social media. I think the easiest way to find it would just be searching Defence Connect on your preferred platform. I'm a LinkedIn user. I think LinkedIn's great because it's a great chance for everyone to always share their to share their evolving business pipelines on there. I think it's remarkably interesting for the defense community as a lot of the primes share the new pipelines and, and business changes. Search Defense Connect. You can see it, keep up to date with the top five, six stories for the day. And, and it will save you time. It saves the industry time as a whole. But like I said, we've never been in a more dynamic industry than we are in now. And you do need to keep abreast of, of all the changes because sometimes I feel like you go online, you hit F5, you refresh your screen and something massive's happened in the last 10 minutes. It, there's never been a better time to be in defense industry. And it's a good point also. Make sure you're checking out defenseconnect.com.au during the course of the day because anything big that happens, we get it up immediately. You know, we're quite fortunate that we're pretty well dialed into uh, all the different organizations, both you know, business and also government. So we're typically the first to know what's happening. Uh, so we'll make sure we continue to provide that uh, to you. That's super exciting stuff. And I know we've been very geared towards uh, news and contracts announcements, this particular discussion today, gents. But we do have, a, as you all know, our afternoon insights, uh, Defence Connect Insights, which is our sort of deep dive into more national security, geopolitics, geosecurity issues shaping Australia's approach to defence and national security and resilience and economic prosperity and all that sort of stuff. I know you're always bubbling away with some pet project in the background, Liam and Charbel, where you'd be working up a story over a day or two or even a week, just gathering. Uh, what's been the key thrust most recently on these type of articles, Liam? So we received a submission from uh, retired Major General Senator Jim Mullen last week, which I thought was a really, really interesting piece. And it was a very frank analysis of Australia's readiness. And I think too many commentators, too many analysts now are either overly pessimistic or overly optimistic considering Australia's position in the region. But Senator Molden provided a very frank analysis of Australia's readiness in the region and how Australia can greater prepare. And he touches on the fact that we were talking about before, that the character of warfare is changing. I won't say the nature of warfare because I know too many von Klausowitz 
uh, ideologues out there again will furiously email me if I ever say that the nature of warfare changes. So I'll taper what I'm saying. I'll say the characteristic of warfare is changing to make it more palatable to everyone at home. But, you know, we are in a multi, multi-domain sphere now where Australia does have to be ready for those things like cyber attacks. We do have to be technologically advanced regarding those emerging technologies. But we also do need to have that national resilience at home that if we ever did or were in the event of all-out war, that our traditional supply chains, uh, the way that we would import spare parts, munitions, and even knowledge or or new pieces of equipment from overseas, we just have to frankly expect that they won't be there. So uh, Senator Mullen's piece looks at it very holistically. It's a great a great frank analysis and that's on um, defenseconnect.com.au under opinion pieces. Obviously, we've been keeping up to date with our analyses of the Indo-Pacific. So we've been looking at uh, one piece was the kind of the vaccine diplomacy wars that are occurring throughout the Indo-Pacific and whether Australia is actually really kind of getting credit. So Scott Morrison, Prime Minister Morrison and the government has pledged about 15 million vaccines to our regional neighbours and largely we're quite delivering on it. We, we've delivered tens of thousands of vaccines. I think we've delivered about 300,000 vaccines to Fiji. We've, we've largely been following on with our promises. But at the same time, China has very successfully undertaken their own vaccine diplomacy. They're now sending their Sinovax and Sinopharm to about 80 plus countries around the world and on every continent. I know they're sending uh, their vaccines to Papua New Guinea and East Timor. So they're very much kind of on Australia's really doorstep. It's an expansion of the sort of Belt and Road initiative, right? It they're is. It is an expansion on Belt and Road. Yeah. yeah. And, and what they've done is, you know, I look at it from two aspects. One it increases the goodwill for their Belt and Road partners already, for those who are already in there to expand on that goodwill. But for a lot of governments, and coronavirus, COVID is a very concerning thing for a lot of governments, it creates dialogue where dialogue previously didn't exist, that the Chinese government can reach out to to these new countries and say, hey, here you go, we've got the vaccines which no one else can seemingly supply at the moment, and we'll either give it to you as a gift or it'll come with a debt dollar sign attached to it. So it also ties into that debt diplomacy. Yeah. So well, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of vaccine coercion now, right? We'll give you the uh, we'll give you the vaccine. However, uh, yeah. dot dot dot. But I, I think therein lies the opportunity for Australia. Uh, we've made it very clear through our defence strategy that um, uh, the Pacific is our backyard and our sphere of influence. So the nation really needs to step up to be supported in these Pacific nations because they're important partners. We need to keep an eye on them keep looking after them and having that sort of approach or application towards uh, strengthening national security. I think it works at all favours. So I look forward to watching how all this plays out, mate. Yeah, and I think one big thing is if I could have any advice to our key decision makers, it is stop the false humility. There was a an analysis done uh, that I read online about opinions in Indonesia to Australia's foreign aid program. And despite giving oodles amounts of money, actually remarkably few people in Indonesia really understood how much money we give compared to other countries. I think one of the examples was, you know, that they thought like double the amount of Indonesians thought that the EU gave the most as opposed to the number of people that thought Australia gave the most aid. And I think we're not tooting our horn enough because a lot of our regional neighbours simply don't understand how much we give them, how much money and aid and support we give them. And they do think a majority of their aid comes from China or or the European Union or the United States, whereas that's actually not true. It is coming from us. And Mm. unless we kind of toot our own horn, and yes, it lacks humility, but unless, unless we toot our own horn and show how much we are doing, hmm. we won't get that reciprocal goodwill with our neighbours. Um, well, I think, I think it's a fair observation. Yeah, definitely a fair observation, something worth uh, exploring. I guess the uh, dichotomy of all this is that, you know, the great Australian tall poppy syndrome, you don't want to talk yourself up too much because, you know, someone will chop you down um, and that's sort of inherent in our culture. But I don't think the same thing applies to the, the politics of reality in the Indo-Pacific right now. I think we need to maybe stick up a few more signs and say, this bridge has been provided mm. by dot 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 Australia. This hospital, this vaccine clinic, this school, this whatever. And um, you know, Oz does some great work up in those areas, delivering many different programs just to 
uh, support the completeness and wholeness of how some of these communities are living in, there is obviously a national security imperative connected with this. So I'd like to see that worked up a little bit more, how Australia's got to break the shackles of the tall poppy syndrome in its uh, aid giving within mm. the Indo Pacific, mate. That's uh, you, you can own that idea, I reckon. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think we're doing all the right things. And again, it's not with the vaccines that they weren't empty promises. You know, we are following through with that and we are helping these countries with their vaccines. But we just got to make sure people are aware of it. And yeah. I think it's I think it's that simple. Well, it's both the locals and the wider national community as well that uh, Australia is playing a part. We do punch above our weight in many ways for a, a small nation, but we're a middle power, an emerging middle power. Like I think a lifestyle superpower, what I like to call us, it's the place where everyone wants to be uh, at the mm-hmm. moment. And uh, come um, the close of COVID, when our borders open, I think um, it's going to be a golden age for Australia moving forward. We're just going to keep one eye towards our national security and one of the things that we continue to focus on, defenseconnect.com.au and across the insights on Defence Connect. Um, let's sign off. Uh, Sharbel, sorry, mate, we've been dominating the airways, musing about our aid policy. Anything to conclude with, mate? No, I just thought, um, speaking of you know, golden age and punching above our weight, shout out to the Australians who are doing a good job at the Olympics at the moment. Um, uh, yeah. I think ranked fourth at the moment. So shout out to them. Hopefully they win more gold for us. Yeah, I watch, uh, I'm a water power player, so I watched the game last night. Uh, it was good to see. Uh, the Sharks get up. Um, you're watching, uh, Liam, the Olympics. I'm sure we can find a defence story in this somehow. Uh, we're, we're already working on it, Phil. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, we, we, we've already got that boiling. Look, I gave up when Australia didn't get past the pool stage on the Rugby Sevens. Look, I think having Argentina, New Zealand and Australia in the same pool was was categorically unfair. Um, it's fixed, Liam. It was fixed. And- <laughs> it, it, it must have been. There's no other explanation. And when we didn't get past the pool stage, I turned off the Olympics. No yeah. more Olympics on my TV. Well, the thing you've got to concentrate on right now, mate, is that moustache. You're looking more and more army every <laughs> single day. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I'll call you out on that. Well, Maybe we I, get a photo I, up. I'm getting a lot of complaints. So I, I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like it's got to go soon. <laughs> nah, let it go, mate. Get nice yeah. and bushy is what that needs to be. Gentlemen, thanks for your time today and your insights. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much, Phil. No, thank you. It's good to be on again. Nice one. Uh, remember, to everyone, check out defenseconnect.com to do two things you need to know, which are cut off AIC Summit. If you're not yet registered in Canberra, 25th of August, uh, go and check that out right now. Just Google AIC Summit and the Australian Defence Industry Awards. Make sure you secure your tickets. Uh, the one thing Liam mentioned there, uh, the new 30, 40 second update every single day, just uh, you can find it on Defence Connect. Just search it on any of the social platforms, LinkedIn, for example. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye.